All righty. Good evening, everybody, and a happy Thursday to you all. My name is J.D. Moore, coming in to you live from the Reddit CFB account. We've got a Reddit talk tonight. We are super excited to have a special guest in the house with us tonight. That is Fred Siegel. He is behind Freezing Cold Takes. We're going to talk about his new book. We're going to talk about some of the famous uh, cold cold takes that have taken place in the football world before and we're going to talk about college football and some of the awesome things that we've seen him him do with this account i'm going ahead and bring up my co-host up here now i see our guest is here and up on the stage and serious i see that you are up here as well my friend how are you doing this evening doing great jd ready to hear about some uh, cold takes Fantastic. I know that we are also waiting on our guest host as well, Mr. Christopher Derrett. He'll be jumping in and helping us out a little bit with these questions as well. But you know what? We do have Fred up here. And Fred, uh, I know that you've got your first book up. And there we go. I see Chris right now. So I'm sending him that co-host link. But Fred, you know, you have been running Old Takes Exposed since 2015. You're an attorney by trade. And of course, you have appeared on several radio shows, uh, TV shows, podcasts, featured in several publications. But I hear that you have a book out this week. Yeah, it came out on Tuesday. It's Freezing Cold Takes NFL. It's not a college football one. I could probably do one for that if someone let me, but it would be hard to figure out which ones to use because there's so many. But this one's Freezing Cold Takes NFL. It's basically an encyclopedia of predictions and inaccurate commentary from football media about some of the great teams and players in NFL history, past and present. It's not an extension of my feed. It's it's stories. It goes delves into certain teams from the past and players from the past when a lot of cold takes were made in a certain situation like when Bill Belichick was hired for the Patriots or when the Cowboys started out with Jerry Jones and Jimmy Johnson and like certain drafts and other stories that you may not know but like also things like Brett Favre and you know Reggie White was signed with the Packers and and newer stuff like when Chip Kelly was the coach of the Eagles and they had a great first game so that type of stuff. So it's not really an extension in my feed. It's I use a lot of research. There's a 46 pages of index notes, probably like 500 different sites. So it took me two years to do. There's a lot of stuff in there. And I think everybody who likes NFL in some way, any all ages will enjoy this. And there's I, I can guarantee there's a lot of things that in there that you didn't know before you started reading that happened. And some things that could surprise you in situations that you do did know that happened. Well, I did get an advanced copy of that book. It is a fantastic read, very digestible, incredible history that goes around it. But, you know, Fred, first and foremost, uh, I do want to get a good definition across the board. First and foremost, what exactly is a freezing cold take and what qualifies as one? Well, I think what qualifies as a freezing cold take is something that someone made a prediction and that prediction turned out to be wrong or someone made a someone made a commentary about a certain player or certain team and that commentary was kind of like it turned out to be incorrect now sometimes it's subjective like when you say a player is going to be great and then the player turns out to be bad and that suggested subjective but everyone understands and knows like who ended up being bad like if you said ryan leaf was going to be great it's subjective that he turned out to be bad but nobody will make the argument that he was good so stuff like that but Anything you say that turned out to be wrong could be a freezing cold take, but not many things could be have the strength or like the the power of being a great enough freezing cold take to be mentioned on the feed or even be ridiculed by anybody outside of my feed. It would have to be something a lot bigger than that. Not just saying like I was going to beat Iowa State this week and Iowa loses. It would have to be a lot bolder. It would have to be a lot confidence in it or just something really funny. It has to be a lot, uh, has to have a lot more of, you know, more provocative than just anything minor like that. So where did the idea for creating a Twitter, Facebook, Instagram account to, uh, to showcase these just absolutely, totally wrong takes come from in the first place? And did you have any idea that, that it could potentially grow to be what it is now? No, I was just sitting, I was just like using Twitter like anyone else. And I, I was just, I wanted to do something as a counter to sports media folks reposting their accurate predictions. They had self-congratulatory messages 
And I said to myself, like, someone should be the person who repost these same people's tweets that turned out to be dead wrong. And I just became that person. I had a, a very good background as a lawyer in search using search terms when I was using the you know platforms like Westlaw and LexisNexis, which are the type of platforms you look for case law. And a lot of the search terms were the same for Twitter. And I used those to find all these old tweets. And when I did it, it, it became big very fast. I did not think it was going to be big. I thought it was just going to be something to troll the media with. Yeah, awesome. Hey, Fred, um, you mentioned it just now and um, kind of as you were speaking earlier, but can you kind of walk us through that process of, of discovering these freezing cold takes? And has your process changed over time as you've been um, authoring this book? And obviously, the, uh, the account has really taken off over the years. Yeah. So what you can do is search for an old take or a cold take. You, you take I know how to use the search term where I could search for certain things in specific dates. And when something happens, that could be something where you look, could look for the past for cold takes. Like, let's say a coach was fired. You go to Google and type in the name of the coach and when they were hired, and just put hired and you'll get an article about when they were hired. And then you just look up the coach's name and all the tweets from that day that they were hired. And then you'll find all these like journalists saying, great hire, home run hire. And then you could post that. So that's like something you could do. You look up, you look up a team who was who had a great second half of the season and won the Super Bowl. You look up like when they lost their fourth straight game at the beginning of the year, or went one and one and five at the beginning of the year. That will have the most posts about them being completely out of it and their season over. So you know stuff like that. Now it's a lot easier. Everybody sends me all the takes, and I get like a hundred different tags every single day. So when you get those tags every single day, what kind of tempers a cold take from, you know, a tweet that's taken out of context? Like, is there a subjective or an objective line that crosses for you to say, yes, this is now officially a cold take? It's just all by like feel. Yeah, you see it and you think it could be good. You think it's good enough for it. You, it, it, you have to play it by whenever it comes. You just listen, to, you look at it and you see, hey, this one's good. But if it's something that you, you have to look at it sometimes and see if the person's being sarcastic. You also want to look at if someone's just telling a joke. There's a, like a genuine requirement. Like you have to be genuine, at least somewhat genuine. It's not like a reverse jinx attempt. It's not like somebody who's just trying to get a rise out of someone else. I feel like it has to be a genuine take, at least part of it. Have you gotten a feel for the uh, virality aspect of it over time as well, to where now you can spot one and you just know that that's going to do numbers, going to get a lot of interactions off of this one. And that one, yeah, it's a genuine cold take, but it's just not really going to get the engagement that another one would. Oh, yeah. I, I get tagged to a lot of them like that, unfortunately, for people like who are really big fans of college baseball. You know, like I get tagged to Michigan won a three-game series. And someone said they were going to lose the series. I'm not going to post that. It, it really depends on the quality of the and the amount people know it, but then the amount people – understand it how nationally popular it is that type of stuff and how funny it is how, how much people will think that it it will give them a laugh or just like how truly bad it is and i can tell pretty much when something's not going to get a lot of engagement and I, and I won't use it back when i first started i used a lot of, of almost everything but the standards have been raised much higher yeah, speaking of higher standards, now that you are an author um, with an upcoming book, we've taken a look, you know, it's at several of the uh, the cold takes in in the book, right? And some of those include some kind of old old school newspaper articles, and you even had a chance to speak with some of those columnists who wrote those those takes, you know, in the '90s. I was wondering what you know similarities or, or differences do you see in the cold take landscape, you know, now versus the quote unquote pre internet era that where newspaper columnists really kind of dominated and dictated the conversation? Oh, well, now people aren't afraid to say anything at any time. And even the, the most craziest stuff, people are looking for attention and they're looking to be noticed. And it doesn't really matter to some people if they're wrong or right. I, a great example is this, I had in, sec, in the second chapter of my book, there's this article that Greg Cody from the Miami Herald wrote that in 1993 that suggested that the Dolphins should trade Dan Marino and keep Scott Mitchell, who Scott Mitchell had played like three good games for the Dolphins after Dan Marino got hurt. And that type of thing went crazy in Miami. 
it was just like everyone was booing him when, when he went on a, a, a dolphin show later in the week. And he was just crucified like it was the biggest deal. And it was like something that came out of nowhere and was very, very hit people hard in that in Miami. But that type of thing would if, if Scott Mitchell was playing a great game now, like you get three people to tweet trade Marino, keep Scott Mitchell. And then like Nick Wright and, and Stephen A. Smith would both say it the next morning and nobody would bat an eye. They'd just say, Oh, that's stupid. That's it. And then they, people would forget about it. So it's just so much more prevalent now. And when people write columns back in the day, they really thought about it. They thought about what they were going to say. And if, if they didn't think that it was something that sounded good or, they wanted to polish it up a little bit. They would write it in a way that wasn't as provocative as just writing a tweet, a stream of conscience, or going on a TV show and you're yelling out at the tape. So it was a lot different. You don't, you didn't get a lot of articles like that back then, and you get it every day now. You know, you've mentioned the guys like Stephen A. Smith and the guys who will go out and on the show and be entertaining as opposed to uh, being forming. Uh, but you recently revealed on the Dan Patrick show that you've had to limit the amount of cold takes that have been prophesied by those guys, Skip Bayless, Colin Coward, et cetera, et cetera. How do you take the litmus test of this guy is a genuine hot take artist who wants to be right versus this is someone who's just entertaining and trying to seek attention? Uh, you just figure it out when you're thinking about when you look at it. I mean, you know, with Skip Bayless, it's almost certain that his he's balancing entertainment over anything logical. And you just get a feel for it. You see what they're trying to do and you see what they've been doing in the past. And you just decide, hey, like this isn't even worth it. Guys like Skip could be on my feet every single day. It would just get so old. So I don't use him that much unless it's like really, really, really funny. I get a lot of tags to him, so I know that's what people want to see. So I do it sometimes, but just not that often. Because it, the, the, the feed would take up, would be just completely covered with their takes. It wouldn't even be fun. So I just kind of keep it to a minimum and try to keep guys like that to a minimum. But we all know, and I'm not even criticizing them, because we all know that they would be fired if they didn't do that type of thing. Because that's what they were hired for. You just don't want to buy into it all the time and plaster it all over your screen in, in something that people will find as old. It will, it will just get played out, the, the Bayless thing. In terms of tags, I mean, we know that, like with Twitter, whenever you tag or retweet or quote tweet somebody, you know, they're going to get a notification from it. What's been the probably the funniest or the most explosive reaction you've ever had from cold taking a sports personality? Because we know that some of them expect it, but some probably get a little heated at the uh, idea of being called out for being wrong. I get a lot of them. I don't remember a lot of their names, but they def- a lot of them have blue checks. I just didn't remember who they are. But Luganville, Tom Luganville, like the, t- what, d- pulled the mother's basement type thing. When I first started the feed, he was talking about how I was hiding in my mom's basement, doing all this stuff, finding his old take. He was talking about how Patrick Henry... No, Derrick Henry. He was talking about Derrick Henry is just not suited to be a running back in college. He was going to be a linebacker. And I found that post by him. It was like probably around 2012. And he called me out about that. John Heyman, that guy, got really mad at me when someone asked him about it on the radio. But I don't remember what he said. But there are guys who just talk about it at the beginning of the year. They'll, they'll say before like the college football season starts last year. Some guy wrote that, remember, Old Takes Expose is the most unoriginal feed. He's useless. He ruins everything. <laughs> Remember, don't give in, you know. And of course, like I retweeted it and everyone made fun of him. But that type of stuff happens a lot. Now, I've never gotten anything so bad where someone got really mad at me and kind of just made me feel like threatened or anything. It's just someone just getting a little bit upset looking. And then when I post about it, they look really dumb. And so in, in the uh, upcoming book, Fred, you, you have some chapters where um, it really keys in, you know, on one particular take. And then there's other pieces kind of like compilation style with just different takes on different players and different personalities. So going off of the previous question, are there, are there any people in particular that you think might, might get a little defensive, might get a little, a little irked when they see their take in your book? 
Yeah, I mean, there are guys who have just never mentioned a, a lot. Some guys have just never mentioned that they had uh, their old post or their old. Most of the people talk about what they said in the past, but there are some people who like kind of in a weird way have never talked about it. And one of those guys is I, I do a chapter on, uh, you know, when when and Aaron Rodgers was taking over as the quarterback of the Packers, he had never played. He had only played like a half of meaningful football in Green Bay in three years, but he was finally taking over after uh, they pushed Favre out in 2008. And when, and as he was about to be the starting quarterback in the draft, they Packers picked in the second round, Brian Brom. And Brom was from Louisville. He was a top 10 pick if he were to come out in junior year, but after senior year, he was kind of slipped down. And Merrill Hodge and, and Todd McShay said that in the studio, the ESPN studio, when he was drafted, they said that Brom has more upside than Aaron Rodgers. And it turns out to like be an all time bad take. And, you know, McShay has never, never spoken about it ever. And I don't think he likes hearing about it at all. One of the other things that I also found really interesting uh, inside your book as well is not even just the immense amount of research uh, that you ended up taking into it, but it's also the use of narrative. It's the use of the quick hit compiled cold takes. It's the use of columns and historical data from newspapers. I'm really curious, how did you approach your research for your new book? Uh, you just have to go through a gazillion newspaper articles from the past that even mention a player's name or talk about it. And you look at the dates from the time period and you just go through it. And you kind of, you also want to get a feel for what actually happened during those weeks and kind of put together the story and then try to look for more stuff within that, those times. I also, I looked through just thousands and thousands of newspaper articles. I was subscribed to a service, newspaper.com and Newsbank. And they allow and they have just millions and millions of paper, newspaper articles that you look through and it's like a database. But I also watch games. You watch old games. There's a lot of old games on YouTube and you watch them and you listen, wait for the announcer to say something. And I could watch like five games from a team and the announcer said like, then you get like two sound bites that could you possibly use. But you have to go through all that to get everything. And you try to find new stories there's a lot of news stories from the on YouTube where you can just find like a newscast from a certain date from a certain city you can go through that. You go through media columns. So like the Miami Herald had a media column every week and I knew it. And I went through every single media column to see if there were any quotes because they would go back and talk about quotes from announcers during games and you could find that. So it was just all that kind of stuff all at once, constantly looking at it. It was it was labor of love, I guess. Fred, we know that whenever somebody does that much research, there are always going to be things that you have to leave on the cutting room floor that just aren't going to fit in yeah. the book. What's the one that you probably most regret that you thought was a really cool story that you just didn't have room for it? Oh, I love the, the one I the one I really regret cutting. I wrote a whole thing on it. I wrote like four extra chapters. I, there were so many pages I cut. I had a max word requirement. It was the Eagles from the 2017 with like Doug Peterson and when Carson Wentz went, got hurt and Nick Foles came in, there's a lot of great stuff there and Doug Peterson being hired and stuff like that. That was a great one. Also, I didn't do, I did so much Patriot stuff that I had to cut out the Patriot stuff from like 2005 to 2019. So there's a lot of dynasty is done stuff that I didn't, I left out. So that kind of stuff too, I took out as well. And I also had a cat, a whole chapter on quarterbacks, who, and this would have been good for college football fans, quarterbacks who were winners in college football, that analysts would say he's going to, that, that were had clearly deficient physically or clearly flawed in terms of their arm strength, that announcers or analysts would say, it doesn't matter. He's a winner. Like Tim Tebow, uh, Danny Werfel, when I was growing up, he was the quarterback for the Gators. That was one of them. Ken Dorsey, who's now the offensive coordinator for the Bills, but he was the quarterback on that Hurricanes team and, and from 2000, 2002. Clearly had, didn't have the arm strength to be a great quarterback in the NFL, but people were saying, well, he's won a gazillion games. So I, I did a, a whole chapter on that they had to cut. Yeah, Fred, how did you arrive at the, the overall format of the book? Because some pieces are uh, longer form, some pieces are kind of quick hit, uh, you know, compilation of takes. And what what can can you, in your own words, what can we expect to see out of the book in terms of anecdotes versus just good old kind of tweet style cold takes? Well, there's one chapter on the draft. I use a whole chapter on the draft. There's about 40 or 50 just 
amazing cold takes that I had compiled over the time I was doing the book about players when they were drafted or before they were drafted. There's one about Emmett Smith, one about you know Patrick Mahomes, Gron- Rob Gronkowski, Josh Allen, Bruce Smith, Chris Dolman, any of these guys from the past, Dan Marino, and you know Walter Payton's even re- re- referenced in there when he was drafted in 75. Phil Sims, just like all those guys. And I just do a list. And that's really the only thing that's really close to my feed. That really resembles my feed. The rest are stories. And they're stories about a moment or a team in players' history, a, a team or player's history where like an underlying sentiment was popular among the media. And I found a substantial amount of articles and tweets and quotes and then explore how that happened. So like there was a, a chapter I have on, on Bill Coward and the Steelers and for at least four or five years during the Cowher era, he was, everybody was calling for his head. And I go through like the seasons and why it happened. And some of the reasons people were wanted the, he wasn't getting along with the general manager. And then I talk about how the, the columnists wanted the general manager to stay, but kick Cowher out. Like I have a chapter on Steve Young and Joe Montana, that push and pull. And surprising stuff come around when you're listening to when you're doing research like not only was steve young dealing with the joe montana situation and how fighting him to be the starting quarterback but he also had a lot of reporters talking about how they 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 should cut steve young and keep steve bono this guy steve bono is the backup quarterback and he should be the starter so that came around when i didn't realize even would be something that I would be writing about and like Troy Aikman, the Cowboys, the Herschel Walker trade. And I, I talk about it, it's really in narrative form. So I give the whole possible gambit of the story that happened. I include the Tom Coughlin Giants. That's a great one. Tom Coughlin. I mean, he was getting completely there was like a campaign by the media to fire him and the fans. So Eli Manning and. And I have a whole chapter on that improbable run from the 2007 Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl team, when they beat the Patriots at the end and the Patriots were undefeated. Just cu- and there's just so many things that that people said that you never would expect. Yeah. So when people do get cold takes, what is the general sentiment from people? Are, are they? Is it a badge of honor now to to be cold taked, or is it more often than not people being defensive about it? No, that people. People either ignore it or they use it as a badge of honor. I think people are, after a while, people started to understand that if you complain about it, it's just not a good look. You're never going to, it's never going to be a good look. So you just ignore it or you um, say it's a badge of honor. Sometimes people will fight with me whether it actually is a cold take. And I guess that's fair if you want to argue about that. Or they'll argue that, hey, this player got hurt. Or to be fair, everyone thought about that at the time. Yeah, you know, stuff like that. But most of all, it's it's pretty good. I mean, I, I I get a lot of loser stuff too. A lot of that hominem attacks, like I'm a loser. One of it is you have nothing better to do with your life, something like that. A lot of that. But you know, I just kind of ignore that or retweet it, and then everybody just says tells that person how that doesn't look good. Fred, we are coming up on a little bit of half an hour. Certainly want to respect your time uh, and just want to make sure if you're good to keep going because we got plenty of questions going on after this if you're good to spend a couple more uh, minutes with us. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. I, I, is this the type of thing where like everyone starts asking questions? It seems like a really cool format. I've never done this before in my life. Well, hey, you know what? Thank you first and foremost for uh, making yeah. this your first Twitter yeah, space. Yeah. Uh, but we have folks on here 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes. I mean, we've even done call-in shows where we've gone four hours long. We will not be going that long. Awesome. Uh, we'll be respecting your evening on that. But uh, once again, this is RCFB Talk 58. You've got J.D. Moore hosting tonight on the Reddit CFB account. We've got our regular co-host, Sirius, on the mic as well. Joining us as well is a guest co-host this evening, Chris Derrett, as our main host, Bobak, Bobak, wow, Bobak Hayeri is out on vacation on this week. And of course, we've got Fred Siegel uh, out here. He's talking about his latest book that is Freezing Cold Takes, Football Media's Most Inaccurate Predictions and the Fascinating Stories Behind Them. That is available now in stores and online wherever you go and get your books at. And Fred, uh, you had mentioned 
uh, some of those people taking it as a badge of honor or trying to ignore it. Uh, I absolutely loved in your book, the first opening quotes uh, that you had in your introduction, everyone from Adam Schefter uh, to all these other major reporters all talking about, you know, what it's like to get cold taked and, uh, you know, in report talks about, you know, I stand by every take that I've ever had. (laughs) Uh, Michael Lombardi uh, also speaks about it as well. Uh, What was it like asking for them uh, for that type of testimonial and getting that type of response back? Oh, I was excited. I mean, those guys, two of those guys, Rappaport and Schefter, um, they, they have followed the feed for a long time. And occasionally are, are, you know, I'll post something and then they'll go in and, 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 and laugh about it in my messages. So I had chatted with them before and that's how I was able to ask them. I was excited to get it. I had no idea whether I would get it or not, or, or, or whether they would, um, you know, do that. We had to send them a copy of the book before it was even in the, the form it is. It was just like a, a, a binder with the, with the, the, uh, the draft of it, but um, yeah, it was great. I think it was great. I mean, those guys have been very supportive of the feed for a long time, for like six years. So it was really good uh, to have that happen. Um, Mike Lombardi was one of the guys who was really prominently featured by the Eagles in the 2017 after they won the Super Bowl. I think Jason Kelsey went on at, at, at the parade on top of the steps of the art museum. He's like that clown, Mike Lombardi had, Doug Peterson is the worst hire. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was great. I mean, I loved it. Um, there, there are other people who who like the feed a lot, who have been following the feed for a long time, um, who uh, who I was able to like send a book to, and they promoted it, or like they they were posted a picture of it, and it was great. I'm sure that was a you had a couple of pleasant surprises there in in grant in having some of those interviews granted. Um, and uh, as far as the the takes, um, have it, were any of those surprising to you, especially going back into some of the archives where you mentioned you had to watch hours and hours of yeah. uh, game film? Um, and today, as you mentioned, like not a lot is super surprising because kind of anybody will say anything. But did anything kind of surprise you? Oh, yeah. One of the great ones that surprised me was the Saints. Um, it was a little side thing. How, how, how happy the Saints were to trade for one of the when when the Cowboys traded for traded Herschel Walker to the Vikings in 89. They were 0 and 5 and they ended up going 1 and 15 that season. But they traded for about a it's really infamous deal. They traded for about 10 draft picks from the Vikings and they turned those draft picks into a dynasty. But one of the side trades that wasn't a part of the Herschel Walker trade was the Cowboys trading Steve Walsh, who was one of those guys I was talking about, like who didn't have a good arm and was really a kind of a winner in college football. Um, but he was on the Cowboys. He was backing up Aikman. And the, the Saints traded a first round pick, a third round pick and a second round pick for this guy, Walsh. And Walsh played his first game for the Saints in 1990 and was just so they won against the Browns. He threw three touchdowns and the saints media were just eating it up. Like they thought they had the super bowl, the next guy to take him to the super bowl and Walsh Walsh flamed out pretty quickly over there, but it was something I learned that was, it was really, really fascinating to me. And that trade, that Walsh trade for the Cowboys, it was like, nobody talked about it, but who trades the first, the second and the third round pick for a backup quarterback. It was amazing. Fred, you've talked about, uh, mentioned college football a few times. Have you noticed a difference in tone between the uh, the kind of hot takes you see with the pros versus other sports like college football or some of the other um, sports that you've looked at? Yeah, college football is the most reactionary there is. There's, uh, there's no more reactionary <laughs> sports thing. Than Surely not. Well, well, first of all, college football – I don't care what any NFL fans is, but college football is the most sensitive fans. They're so passionate and sensitive and they're very, very, very protective, like so protective over their guys and their team and their players. And, and it's just 
like it's so reactionary in, every, in so many ways. Like if a team loses a game in the first, you've seen it so many times before a team loses a game in the first week or two of the season and they're ro- written off. And it's like, this, it's like, are you kidding me? Like this is way too early, but it, it's, and at that same time, the fans want to fire the coach. And the college football season, it, it seems so short, but in, in the in like the cold take na- or the narratives that permeate through a season, it's really long. How many narratives permeate college football through a season? The first week this team's the best team. And then by the end of the they're like they're like seven and five by the end of the year. You know, like it's like uh what Ohio State lost to Virginia Tech at home in 2014. And they were written off. That was it. And they won the title. It was uh, it, 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 in, when Georgia lost Alabama in the SEC game. Immediately. I mean, right away, you had to think, like, Georgia was going to be heavily favored in both their games. I mean, in their first game in the college football playoff. So they were going to play Bama again. And why did everyone think that automatically Bama was going to win? It's just the it's automatically the it's so reactionary to what happened the week before or the play that happened or this quarterback's garbage because he threw had a bad half there's nothing more reactionary than college football and there's nobody no fans are more sensitive than college football you know you say that college uh football has the strongest reactions it's the most reactionary sport uh you know we at reddit cfb have never once ever been reactionary to any development uh when it comes to college football we have no cold takes whatsoever um i know that you've been doing a little bit of research uh what have been some of your favorite moments uh from our account uh because i know we've been tagged a couple times in uh freezing cold takes we have completely owned up to them uh in the moment but what have been some of the ones that you've looked at and gone oh man this is fun in hindsight well your account is from what you we discussed it like a couple minutes ago about like trying to evaluate the tweet as if like the, the genuineness of the tweet you guys um, clearly favor making a joke over like a rational take. Like a lot of like you, there, there were many takes that you did about making fun of the SEC. Like a second, the second, like the SEC team is down by like three to nothing. Fred, don't tell them all of our secrets. Yeah, we, yeah, we yeah, got to keep like, some of this on the DL. <laughs> well, even the, just like, so I don't consider those as genuine. I just did not post those. I don't, I don't consider those as genuine but here's some of the good ones like like uh um with there was the playoff game between the uh in night in 2019 the playoff game between the clemson and ohio state it was uh it, that was a big that was a that was a um who was it clemson and ohio state 2019 so clemson won that game it was Josh, Trevor Lawrence versus Justin Fields. And you wrote, this game is getting referenced like 50 times when Lawrence and Fields meet as the starting quarterbacks in, in Super Bowl LIX. Now, I don't know what that year that is. but uh, And then you wrote, apologies to Joe Burrow. You're going to the Bengals. <laughs> Who could have seen any kind of success of any man going into Cincinnati? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Burrow made the Super Bowl right away. So that's like uh, uh, you, you put up uh, this year with you piled on um, Oklahoma mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. during that Texas Oklahoma game. Well, Texas was up 28 7. And, you know, then they played zero defense the rest of the game uh, and lost. And you're like, Texas is styling on this Oklahoma team. Thanks for coming out Sooners. <laughs> and of course, Texas is back, you wrote. Um, a great one was during the, Can- the Kansas versus North Carolina National Championship game. And you wrote that, and you basically had a blind graph when Kansas was up. I mean, North Carolina was up by a lot of points in the first half. And, you know, the player two has left the game. <laughs> And that was Kansas. 
and I think that you had a, uh, one more that I found. Oh, yeah. Remember last year during the Alabama A&M game? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. They, they, it was a, either a two-point conversion attempt or it was a touchdown where Texas A&M had a confusion. They just left the wide receiver wide open inside of the field. And Bryce just threw it to him. Mm-hmm, and then you mm-hmm. wrote, you wrote, you, you had like the handshake thing. And you wrote, ignoring the left. And losing to Bama every four years in College Station, <laughs> but then ba- then Texas A&M came back and won that game. That they to did. be fair, that was a that was that was a safe game to make fun of up until um, the assistant curse got broken by Jimbo last year. So if you were going to like yeah. go out on a limb and, and throw one out there, that was probably about as safe as you could get statistically. Well, yeah, especially because like at the end of the game, but then at the end of the game. Somehow, like the mediocre Texas A&M quarterback was firing it in there, like it was like he was like um, Montana <laughs> that set that that second half or the, the fourth quarter. Hey Fred, uh, on the on the topic of college football um, and the reactionary nature of college football, uh, have you had much you know interaction with? Um, with uh, players, with students or student athletes, um, because as we know, it's pretty easy to write off, you know, an 18 year old freshman and you look up and by the end of the season or the end of the next year, um, and we have a, you know, you've got, you got a kid coming out of nowhere and, and um, it seems pretty ripe for cold takes, but if you had much interaction with, um, with some of those. Not so many of the players, but uh, Ellinger, Ellinger, I made fun of Ellinger so much. Because after that Georgia Bowl win, he put "We're back." He, he said "We're back." Like that was like infamous. And um, every time Texas lost, I would post that. But at, at some point last year, I don't even think he was still in college. But he wrote that he didn't care. Whatever, whatever. I, I, he wrote something to me like he didn't care what I had to say. I don't care. I'm still, whatever. Love Texas. <laughs> That was probably the one in college that I really remember the most. Some of those college football players follow me. Um, one of the guys from Virginia was really into it. And they won the national championship. But it was college basketball. It was that guy, it was that guy Ty Jerome. He really loved it. He loved everything about it. And it would tag me to it a lot during all that time. Um but I don't know if I'm getting a lot from the college players. I don't know sometimes if they're actually a college player or not. But never the ones that are really good. I've never, I don't think I've had too many of the like really popular ones or like well-known college football players. Uh, they're not really on Twitter that much during the season. I think the coaches make a point not to have them on. Beyond players themselves, are there any uh, individuals that you find yourself uh, being able to target, like outside of just like media folks or fans? Are there ever any times that you get an opportunity to talk about, you know, directors, uh, front office executives or anybody else like that that's beyond a fan base or a uh, media outlet? Oh, yeah. I mean, if they if they say something, I'm going to post about them. Are you talking about interacting with them or or? Or any time, like, uh, have you ever been able to see something like, you know, a front office GM or an athletic director or someone else, uh, a bowl executive maybe, or just someone else outside of the line of, you know, your traditional columnist or uh, your fan with the hot take? Has there ever been a moment where you've gone, oh, wow, someone official has said something very, very cold? Oh, yeah, probably. I mean, I can't think one off the top of my head, but I'm sure that's happened. I mean, with with GMs and... uh... They like to, to, to write things. Uh, athletic directors, um, wh- wh- whatever the old the old Miss Act athletic director, he may be at Texas A and M now, but uh, uh, you know they 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 had a lot of strong statements about you know Ole Miss, uh, you know they didn't do anything wrong. That was before they got put on probation or whatever or got, you know whatever they did, which I don't even remember, but they were very strong about it and had strong statements that turned out to like, I guess, backfire stuff like that. Athletic directors, um, definitely general managers. Uh, 
uh, you know, um, what's the, there's one guy, general manager, Maury, Maury, he really, really loves the feed and he tags sometimes himself things that he said, Daryl Maury, the guy for the Sixers. Now he was with the Rockets. Have there been some cases where you've seen a cold take and you just think in the back of your head, you know, eh, this could probably do well, but it's a little sensitive Really don't want to kind of wade into it or all touch that. Time. All the time. And nobody, and there's a gazillion people who aren't sensitive about tagging me to it. I mean, it, it happens a lot with deaths. Deaths. Like someone will post something about, uh, I remember one time his rapper died, maybe of a drug overdose. And someone found his tweet like from a month prior that said he was clean. And they wanted me to post that. Like, that's like funny, you know? <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? A lot of stuff when it comes to uh, uh, domestic violence type things. Uh, like, I'll get tagged to a lot of stuff about that or something related to that where a player got arrested and then they have a post that they made prior to. But it just doesn't see, it seems in poor taste to do. There's so many things like that that I, I, I just don't use. It happens a lot. I know how I know how it is on Twitter. I'll get backlash from anything, but that type of stuff I'll get tons of backlash. Oh, absolutely. When yeah. something goes up, you know, there's a very fine line between comedy and cruelty. Uh, and I have largely appreciated that you at least have that standard of like, hey, this oh, isn't yeah. something to joke about. This isn't going to be something to uh, promote something that, you know, is mocking in good humor. Uh, I do at least appreciate you uh, having that uh, on there. Yeah, I do that. And when it comes to political stuff, I'll never post it. I don't post anything related to political posts. I don't want that crap in my feed. I don't want those people in my feed. Uh, and, um, because these political people are, are way more sensitive than even college football fans. They'll thoroughly dislike you if you post anything about a politician that they support. <laughs> they get really mad and really sensitive and I, I'm just not for it. And it really pisses people off and I don't want to just piss you. And I don't even know about politics, so. Politics is in the eye of the beholder. The, uh, who, whoever's judging it is basically, it's on their biases. So if you say that this politician, someone will tag me to a tweet that this politician is having a great term. And that, because th that person believes that that politician is not having a great term. But there are other people who do believe that politician is having a great term. It depends on the bias of the person who's judging it. So if I retweet that, I'll have so many people just arguing about whether they're having a good term in my tw in my mentions so i don't do that oh no trust me we have seen plenty of times <laughs> yeah. you know the arguments and the mentions and you just got to hit that mute conversation uh because yeah. it's not being conductive to the overall conversation as well completely understand what that's like well hey i have a curious question for you uh in your book you mentioned uh you know you had originally started your career in law uh you had done that for roughly about eight years uh you ended up uh, getting out of law to pursue some opportunities um, I'm very curious, uh, with that type of background, uh, how does that help uh, in you being able to find uh, better sources, uh, being able to write uh, a little bit more punchy or otherwise uh, be able to improve uh, on your craft of posting cold takes? Well, it helped a lot in all this process, it, 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 researching especially. I mean, that's all I did. So, I'm, I mean, uh, I, for all those time researching in the law, uh, once I kind of figured out how to maneuver with other stuff like cold takes and then doing the book, um, newspapers and all that kind of stuff, I was I was already an expert researcher. I used to write every single day, all day as well. So when I was starting to write the book, I, I mean, I was I, I was a quality writer in terms of I didn't have to like kind of teach myself how to write. But I did have to teach myself how to write in the style that in, for a book, because when you're writing for the law, it's extremely boring and methodical. But um, so I had all that background with me uh, before doing this, because um, it, it's 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 a really difficult. It's, it really takes a lot of experience to be able to consistently write. 
Um, and it took a lot of, you know, people telling me what I was doing wrong writing to learn that. And it was like a marathon in that regard. But the researching is probably the biggest thing. I mean, I could research anything uh, if it's there. If it's there on the Internet or there on the, in the newspaper, I'll find it. Uh, so that's that's really kind of where it really helped the most. All that, you know, training. In all of that research, uh, is there one particular cold take that makes you go, oh, man, this has been my favorite? Or when you think just immediately to, I knew this one was going to have the best reaction. Is there one that immediately sticks out in your mind? Well, when I found the one from, well, when I first started the feed, I found the one from 2014, um, like one of my first searches of Twitter of uh, Cowherd when he wrote, in 2014 that that Dak Prescott will be a backup in the NFL period at tight end period. And uh, that, that was the funniest one. I thought that was so funny when I first saw it, I posted it. It always gets the ultimate reaction. But um, I think that the ones that I found from the games, uh, like from when I was watching games, that was the most exciting. Uh, one of them went, was when Herschel Walker was traded to the Vikings and they needed, they traded for him to get a running back to win the Super Bowl. His first game was against the Packers at home in the Metrodome. And he had 148 yards and two touchdowns and the entire city of Minneapolis was got the Herschel mania. But during the game, Vern Lundquist was the announcer for CBS and they showed in this crowd, the retired running back for the Vikings, uh, Chuck Foreman, and he was the all-time leading rusher for the Vikings at the time. He was the best running back in the history of the franchise at the time. And Vern Lundquist said, um, there's Chuck Foreman with his family. Until today, the best running back the Vikings have ever had. <laughs> Just assuming that Herschel Walker would dominate for the Vikings, he flamed out so quickly uh, with Minnesota. It was just a complete bust. But it was already after, because he ran for 148 yards, he was already the best, going to be the best running back in Vikings history. So as you reflect on um, some of these takes, some of these early takes and, and some of these historical takes, uh, do you allow yourself to, um, to, to imagine or envision what's next? Or is, uh, is the, the, the book hitting the shelves um, and hitting the, hitting the stores kind of the main focus right now oh no when i when i first pitched this book or was about to pitch this book i was going to be all sports like the greatest in sports history but then i decided let's use nfl and um uh, first of all i was having a hard time which ones to do and then i said let's just do one sport and then i could do another one if 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 it goes well so if it does go well or it does do sell enough where the publisher wants me to buy uh uh do another one or another publisher wants me to that's what I want to do. I love it. I loved it. I loved every part of it. So, um, like, I would think about doing an NBA one or a college football one. College football would be really hard to figure out which ones to use. Uh, and um, and maybe uh, a volume two of this one. Because, like I said, there's so many things I left out because of the word requirement. Fred, I have to ask, do you have a process for what to do if you yourself have a cold take? Because we all heard you call Zach Calzada mediocre in reference to the A&M uh, Bama game. He was um, and how it was, how, how, how it was an outlier um, in that game. So if he, he you know, he's at Auburn now. If he goes to Auburn and wins the Heisman and somehow saves Brian Harson's job, or the boosters wind up firing Harson in the first season and then they go on a run, whatever. Um, it's Auburn. We never know. But if he if he has an amazing season, oh, yeah. are you ready for somebody to call you out and they're gonna be like, "Yep, oh, yeah. got, I, I've got, I'm gonna have to retweet retweet myself on this one." I can tell you this. Well, you guys would probably you guys could save the clip and post it. I can tell you this. Um, I if I get a period, if I if I if I spell a word wrong or p- put a period in the wrong place, I get roasted for it. Everybody's looking to roast me. Um, I usually know when it's coming 
I, most of my cold takes are from the replies because I do reply to people and talk about sports. And the biggest one recently I had, I, I was adamant that Mario Cristobal would not leave to go back to Miami. And I have like really, really, really obnoxious takes about it, posts about it. Um, and it's from the beginning of the season. But they're in the replies. But like I knew when it was getting close where he was going to go there, I had to compile all those together and, and, and post them. But as soon as I know, I, I remember that I did something and, and it happens, I'll try to post it myself. Because I know it's coming. But I also get a taste of my own medicine because I'll get like these Miami Hurricanes fans sometimes saying, what do you think about this now? Old takes exposed like and I have already addressed it like six times. Like that person said, like thinks that he got me. Like he found it like a month later. Always a danger when you're the roaster, right? That, uh, People are always looking to try to get one over on you. Well, I think that there's a lot of people who think that I think that I'm better than other people. And it's just not the case. I'm just as stupid as everyone else when it comes to sports. I'm just the guy who posts them. But I don't believe that I'm smarter than anybody else. And I've never acted like I was. I do sometimes get a little testy when people are tagging me to things that just do not relate to my feet at all. But uh, uh, I just don't think that I'm better than anybody. But I think people believe that I do. And it comes across in the when they try to roast me. But I've never, I've never, ever tried to act that way. I'm just as stupid as everyone else. I just post more. What an incredible mantra to live by. <laughs> I can guarantee <laughs> that we believe that same mantra here as well. Yeah, well you know, Fred... Is- I'm no different than anyone else in sports. Absolutely. I, I overreact too. Um, I, I usually, I'm, I, I've been pretty good about never posting about the overreactions. Like I'll never post. I thought UF was totally on the right track. I'm a UF alum. I thought okay. UF okay. was totally on the right track with when the last year, um, when we lost to Bama by one and we outplayed in the second half. Uh, you know, Emory Jones was so good that game. So good. And he wasn't good the rest of the season. But I thought he was really good at that time. I was very optimistic. So, Fred, on the record, as Old Takes Exposed, how many games is Florida going to win this year in its first year under Billy Napier? This is definitely not being recorded for future use. <laughs> I'd be happy if they won seven. I just, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the weakest rosters they've had since I've been following, since, since for 20 years, or since I've been following the team. So, um, so any, I don't even know, I don't know what this, I, I just don't know what they're going to do. Like, I don't, I, no one really knows what to expect from this team. It's the first time I have no idea what to expect, but the, the schedule's hard. And I mean, I think we're going to be underdogs in a lot of games that we're usually favored. I mean, Tennessee's got to be chomping at the bit. They'll be favored by a lot of points this time around. Um, So, and we usually beat them no matter what, even if they're favored, they somehow blow it in some way against us. But I, yeah, I just don't think it's going to be, I'm interested. I'm just interested to see how people react to it. I think people are going to want to see an improvement and you know, that we're headed in the right direction, but I just don't, I don't think that, we're going to be very uh, we're going to be competing for a division title or even for anything special or, or a bowl game, a big bowl game. It's just going to be one of those seasons. Well, you heard it here first folks. If Florida does make it to a new year's six bowl tag, Fred, oh, that's at great. old yeah, take I mean, exposed. Like, those are the least fun. <laughs> those are the least fun ones. I try to avoid those. Uh, well, Fred, a person talking like pleasantly surprised because their team did well. Yeah. I'll post away at that one. I'd be so excited if we made a New Year's Day Bowl. I wouldn't care if that's predicted seven and five. (laughs) 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 Well, Fred, this has been a wonderful hour with you. We're going to go ahead and let you go here in just a second. But before we do, again, a reminder, his newest book, 
Freezing Cold Takes by Fred Siegel, football media's most inaccurate predictions and the fascinating stories behind them. That is available now out through Hatchet Book Group and Philadelphia Running Press. Fred, before we let you get out of here, is there anything that you want to address about your book, about your account, or anything else? The floor is open for you, my friend. I think the book is going to be, So I really, really am very confident that anybody who likes the NFL is going to like the book. I think the book is, and it's not, I, I spent a lot of time on it. Anybody who thinks that it's just a money grab, it would be the most laborious money grab of all time. I, I truly believe that, I truly believe that they'll enjoy it. And it's, easy, it's an easy read. It's easy to follow. And it's just very interesting for anybody who, I truly believe that there's a lot of things that you'll find out that you didn't know before and just interesting facts and, and just history of the league and about players and teams that were very relevant. And I think that that's something that you guys will enjoy. If, if you want something like that, like, I think you, you could crank out three chapters on the toilet in one session. (laughs) Absolutely love that. Well, again, Fred, thank you so much for this past hour. Uh, Really excited about your book. Once again, available wherever you get your books at that is freezing cold takes football media's most inaccurate predictions and the fascinating stories behind them. Fred, thank you so much for coming and joining us on a Thursday evening. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It was fun. Once again, this was Fred Seagal. He's the guy behind Old Takes Exposed. That is at Old Take Exposed. Old Takes Exposed on Twitter, joining us tonight for RCFB Talk 58. So once again, on behalf of Sirius, uh, on behalf of our guest co-host today, Chris Derrett, uh, and myself, J.D. Moore, signing off for Reddit CFB, uh, this has been RCFB Talk 58. Thank you for joining us all this evening, and I'm going to hang up and listen.